this computer. Okay, good morning. Today, Dr. David Pittsburgh is going to talk about discrete approximation of real amphiatic diffusion. Please, David, proceed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I really appreciate it. And before I start, I should I should mention um, just please interrupt me at any time. Um, if, if don't worry about it, it if we go longer, then we can always break and do it. You know, finish later. So um, so please please be sure to um, stop me at any time. Um, and uh, so I'm talking now about the discrete approximation of real empiatic diffusion, and this really comes. Um, this is really uh, this. This is coming out of a, a new paper, um, and it um, it improves um, the the results of a previous work in CMP with um, my collaborator Eric Bakken, and um, I I think that this is a major improvement, and I'm interested in seeing um, what you think. Uh, I won't go into the technical details. Um, uh, too many technical details, um, too many estimates, um, although that's where a lot of the improvement is, but at least you can see at the end the, um, um, in the statements of the final theorems how, uh, what the improvements are. I'm curious to see what you think of it. So um, this is a really more of an introductory lecture, and, um, and so uh, meant, it's meant to sort of uh, for graduate students who are interested in diffusion and who like the area, um, hopefully this provides, at least the first part of the lecture provides some um, reasoning, some reason to get into this area and to study these sorts of things. Um, so I, I don't assume that we have much background in, in, in diffusion uh, or in um, Brownian motion. So uh, I'll start from the very beginning. Um, so if you have this experiment, the experiment is to drop a, a dye in some narrow tube. And so you have, here, let me, so you have like a tube like this, whoops, that doesn't look right. Um, <laughs> it's betraying me. Um, let me see if I can get this right. There we go. So I have some tube like this, and I just drop a little bit of dye there, and uh, the dye will spread out in time and diffuse. And the question is, what's causing that? Um, so we make some basic assumptions. There's uh, the temperature is homogeneous. Uh, the temperature is the same everywhere. Um, there's no difference in the density of the dye and the water that it's in or the fluid that it's in. There's no gravity affecting it to pull it downwards, uh, these sorts of things. So it's a very idealized situation. And um, we aren't, we aren't, it's a narrow tube. So we're not so concerned about the, the, the geometry of it. There's no, everything looks very uniform. Um, uh, everything's very symmetric. And so we just think about this dye as really, um, a movement along a line like this. So really we have some concentration at a point and then it spreads out. And so initially this is gonna be some Dirac delta, the, the, the function that describes the, uh, the density of the dye is gonna be a Dirac delta function. Okay. So this is our, there, our idea. So take UTX to be the concentration at the point X, so this is at zero, and say this here as the point uh, X. And so UTX is the concentration at this point X at time T. Phi of TX is just the die flux from left to right through X at time T. So what does that mean? So let's just think about the units. The concentration would be maybe uh, uh, grams, or it would be a density, it would be like a grams of dye per inch, right? Or I, you, you won't use uh, grams of dye per millimeter or per so, some unit of distance. Uh, grams, so I'll, I'll just say mass divided by uh, length. This is the concentration at time t. Uh, the 
Diflux, um, um, uh, will be an amount, the amount of dye per time that passes through this point to the right and going, going to the right. So the positive will be to the right. So this will be um, mass per time. The mass that goes by this point X per unit time. Uh, that's the die flux. And take U zero comma X to be the initial distribution, which is just uh, a Dirac delta measure, You're, everything's concentrated at zero. So this is the initial setup. Everyone's okay with this? Please just stop me if there's any difficulty. Okay. So that's the setup. And so it's very physical. I, I want everything to be very physically motivated. So that's why I'm, I'm starting at this point. So um, fix first law, uh, is, this is empirical is that the dye flows from higher concentration to lower concentration. Quantitatively, you can put a quantitative rule in this is that there's a positive function D. So D here is not assumed initially to be constant. There's a positive function D so that the flux at time T at the point X is just negative D of X times the gradient. This is a gradient. Um, um, uh, this is the gradient of course in 1D. So, um, so negative d of x times du dx tx. And what does that really mean? Well, if if uh, the, um, the the derivative is in space coordinate is negative, then you will flow to the right into that direction, right? So this is um, encapsulating what it means, or 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 a quantitative sort of version of this statement. So we have this uh, statement about the flux, and then we have the conservation law. And the conservation law uh, just says that the rate of change in the amount of dye in a region is a difference in the fluxes in and out of the boundary. So you're not changing the, the, the you're not compressing it, right? Whatever is, whatever is staying, or I should say, whatever the so this this here um, let's describe what this is right. This is the density. This is the concentration or the density. Let's think about it as a density, and you integrate the density over the region to get the mass in that region. The change in the mass of the region is just the amount uh, going in minus the amount going out. We write it this way for a specific reason, but it's the amount in the amount that's going in minus the amount going out. And that's, um, and that's the, the conservation of mass um, that, um, that's assumed. So these are your two assumptions, conservation of mass and fixed first law. So the idea then is to, um, to see, well, what does this give us? Um, and I'll just do a quick derivation. Um, Really use Leibniz integration rule. You can you can use Leibniz integration rule to to do this. And the, the idea is is that the, the 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 mass is like an extensive property of the of the bulk of the of the. You have you have some some quantity of matter, and um, it has extensive properties and intensive properties. Extensive properties are the properties that um, depend on the, the the amount of stuff you have. The intensive properties are the 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 material properties. So for example. Um, the density here is, is, a, is going to be this material property. It doesn't matter how much you have, the point-wise defined quantity, and the total mass is your, 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 your extensive property. And the change of the extensive, uh, you know, Leibniz integration rule just says that the change in the extensive property uh, is somehow related to this uh, change in the intensive property. And so it's made precise in the following way. So I'm just going to change x1 and x2. So we'll say this is d dt of, um, let's see, x and x plus delta x. I just assume delta is x is positive. Uh, u t x dx. I'm sorry. I have to have a dummy variable, u t z dz. What is this? What is this equal to? Well, this is equal to the integral from x 
x plus delta x um, du dt. Um, the boundary is not changing in time, so we don't have to have those terms. dz, right? Um, so then the conservation law implies that, so Leibniz rule. And so we have the same quantity u, t, z, d, z. This is equal to negative flux tx2 minus v t. Uh, let's change this. So this is x plus delta x minus phi tx, like that. And so we get the this equality. This, okay. This is equal to that problem. So well, then I can separate this just a little bit. And I can divide both sides by the length. And I divide both sides by the length, right. And in fact, let's rewrite this, make it a little prettier. Like this. Okay. And so then what happens is that the, uh, is you take the limit of delta x goes to zero, this becomes d u dt. This is just x is two tx. And this is going to be equal to take limits. And what do you get? Well, let's, uh, let's see. This becomes negative phi dx of t x. But what do we have here? We have fixed first law. So this is equal to d dx of d of x du dx tx. Okay, and so this is then fixed second law. And so this is um, diffusion from uh, a macroscopic perspective. Okay, so that's sort of the macroscopic uh, perspective. Okay, so are we okay with this? Okay, so so now make some assumptions. Suppose the, diffusi the diffusivity of the uh, fluid is independent of x. So that means this d uh, here is just a uh, constant. Well, in this case, on the right-hand side, we get that this is just d, d squared u, dx squared times uh, of tx. And so we get the diffusion equation. So uh, what I do want to do is I do want to replace d with d over two. So we get the probabilist diffusion equation. Um, it just makes the, the solution a little bit prettier. Um, it's, not a big deal. it's not a big difference. Um, otherwise, you just have a four here, I guess. But, um, but uh, um, if you replace d with d over two to obtain this equation, um, the fundamental solution to this equation is, uh, is this rho tx, um, which is a Gaussian. And now this describes the concentration of dye as a function of the pair Tx. Uh, and uh, this is experimentally accurate. Now I should mention that that 1905, Einstein, well, I mean, Einstein was actually not the first, um, it was a, uh, um, um, 
multiple people around this time were working on this. Um, Smolchowski independently in 1906, and Bichelier, I think Bichelier is right, and, uh, and was doing this and doing studying diffusion in terms of finance in, in 1900, actually five years before Einstein. But what Einstein did is uh, he um, re-derived these principles. Uh, he, he, he connected this to a microscopic um, uh, description of matter and, and um, using diffusion was actually able to prove the molecular theory of uh, the molecular theory of matter. And that was one of the great works of 1905 that he did, a study of diffusion. Um, so there's a natural analog of diffusion in the QP setting, in the p -attic setting. It's been studied since the early 1990s. I have a big reference list at the end. I will wait to give the references. Um, and I have it in some kind of historical order, but um, at least as best as I can tell. Um, but it's been studied since the early 1990s. The generator was studied you know, uh, quite a bit earlier. Um, but the key point in the study of p -attic diffusion is to... Um, um, is to replace this Laplace operator with the with the uh, Vladimirov operator, um, and um, and then you get something that's analogous in the piatic setting, like a piatic diffusion. So I'll review this a little bit. Um, so we take I'm not going to go too much. So we've already had a, of course a few talks about piatics and the the the, the, the properties of piatics and, and so on. So I won't go too much into review. I won't really review much about the piatic numbers, but but stop me if you if anybody gets confused. <coughs> Sorry. So take S B Q P to be the Schwartz uh, space of compactly supported locally constant functions. So these are this is the analog of the um, the Schwartz functions in the real setting. Uh, why Schwartz Brewer? Why why um, why locally constant uh, compact support? Well, the smooth compactly supported function. So the smooth compactly supported functions are your test functions in R and R, R N. Um, and uh, the local the local constancy in the piatic setting is really the replacement for the smooth condition um, and the real condition in the real case. Um, so. In the real case, you have your uh, smooth, compactly supported functions, which are your shorts, which are your um, test functions, um, but they're not um, invariant under the uh, Fourier transform. Uh, and so, if you want to be able to take Fourier transforms of di distributions, you really need to have a, a set of test functions that's closed under the Fourier transform. And so, rather than use the the smooth compactly supported functions in the real setting we use the um, the Schwartz functions um, which are not necessarily not necessarily compactly supported but they have um, slow growth and um, smooth and slow growth um, uh, I'm sorry if it's smooth and fast decay so they decay faster than any uh, than any um, uh, polynomial and all the derivatives as well and so that's the uh, that's the Schwartz functions. Um, and so, in, in, oh yeah, go on. Sorry, David. But let me mention something important here. Yeah. That the the Bruchard Schwartz space is is not invariant under the action of the Vladimir operator. Oh, I'm sorry. The the the, the, the Schwartz Bruchard space is mm -hmm. not invariant under the action of the Vladimir operator. Oh, that's right. Yes, absolutely. So really, this is not a true analog of the Schwartz space. Due to that reason, so it is necessary to introduce another space. That's but... yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's that's very true. So this is this is the short square space. It, it, so it's only analogous. It's only analogous for the Fourier transform. Yeah, and now, oh, O G O U S, uh, with respect to the Fourier transform, mm -hmm. it's not. It's definitely not a. Uh, uh, um, invariant under the under the Vladimirov operator, exactly. you don't get back this. So, it, it, so it's not a true analog. That's absolutely exactly. right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, that's actually a really important point to make um, because it, it makes things <laughs> significantly harder to work with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's true. So so the 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 point though is is that with the this is the analog. So in the piatic setting, 
the locally constant compactly supported functions are invariant into the Fourier transform. And in that way, but only in that way, are they the analog of the, uh, of the, um, of the um, uh, Schwartz functions, exactly. but, but they're not invariant under this operator. Yeah. So if we fix a positive real number B and define this multiplication B on the Schwartz Brouwer functions by, so we define it by this, we multiply by the, uh, uh, by the um, uh, modulus of X to the power B. Now, the Vladimirov operator is the unique self-adjoint extension of this essentially self-adjoint operator and it acts on any, that, that acts on any, fun, any schwartz brewer function in this way. So you take the schwartz brewer function, you Fourier transform, hit it with the multiplication operator, take the inverse Fourier transform. This is completely analogous to when B is equal to two, to the Laplace operator, right? but when B is two. But this is not a differential operator, this is a pseudo differential operator. Uh, with MB being the, with, the, with this being the symbol of the operator. In addition, David, this operator is non-local. Yes, that's yeah? right. The it's a non-local. <laughs> that's right. It's a non-local operator. And the, and the, uh, and, well, it's, 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 uh, it's, so in the real, in the reals, we have operators just like this, where B is uh, a fractional, and you have these fractional differential operators, which are also non-local. In the in the piatic setting, they're all non-local. They're all fractional. So uh, so these are always non-local operators. And the, but this is the this is a sort of a, a natural analog. This Vladimirov operator is sort of a natural, or sort of as a formal analog. I should say. I, I shouldn't say natural. It's certainly a formal analog of the Laplace operator. Notice that in the real case, you can mm -hmm. use the, the last formula to define a pseudo differential operator. But in that case, B must be restricted to a, a, a real number between zero and two. Yes. That equation gives rise to the fractional um, Brownian motion. That's right. That's a really, again, that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. Um, because, by the way, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I love it when there's interaction like this. So as much as possible, it's good. But this is exactly right. It's really important uh, that zero, when B in zero, two in reals, this is a really important point, that you get the fractional uh, you get the fractional diffusions. Uh, actually, this is open to zero. Uh, and two is the case when you get the continuous paths, right? Otherwise you get jump paths. But two is when you have, when B is two is when you have the continuous paths. And this is when you get the Wiener process. This is for the Wiener process. So, so here is the analog of the equation in the piatic setting. Um, Now, if you fix sigma to be some positive real number, this is a diffusion constant, this, this pseudo differential equation uh, has its fundamental solution, has this as its fundamental solution. And you know, this is, uh, you solve this in this, uh, you solve the equation just by taking Fourier transforms and so on. But this is the, uh, you notice that in this case here, uh, when B is two, you get a, you get a Gaussian, but there's a big difference between the piatic case and the real case. In the piatic case, you have that the characteristic, this is the characteristic function of, so this is a, a going to be a probability density function. It turns out this is a probability density function. This here is the characteristic function of that probability density function. And the real case is same thing. It, it works in exactly the same way, except a major difference. In the real case, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. I, I, I should say maybe not Gaussian. It's the B is two, it's a Gaussian, but it's still something that's like a Gaussian. If B is two, for example, say the Fourier transform of the Gaussian is a Gaussian in the reals. And so you get a Gaussian process, but 
in the piatics, uh, the Fourier transform is Gaussian, is this thing. It's not a Gaussian, it's more complicated. So, but we get, in any case, we get that this is the fundamental solution to this equation in the piatics. Uh, and this is, remember, this is the QP setting. And this is my, you know, this can be done much more generally. And, uh, and Vradarajan's Uh, 1997 uh, LMP paper, Letters of Mathematical Physics paper. Uh, he actually does this in the setting where uh, the where the um, functions are valued in um, a finite dimensional vector space over a finitely generated division algebra over a non-Archimedean local field. So very, very general setting. He has a good reason for doing that. I wanted to explore that reason for a long time. Actually. There are two possibilities uh, to generalize this equation. One is, is, is that Varadajan established in 1997. And the other possibility is to introduce an analog, an n-dimensional analog of, of the elliptic quadratic forms, okay? And uh, this is another another possibility to obtain uh, n-dimensional versions of, of the periodic field equation. There, there are many, but this is I mean this is the the beginning of the of the generalization of this idea. Right. Nice. Nice. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So it's important to think about these kinds of generalizations because, as we'll soon see, that the parallel the parallel between the the parallel between Piatic and real Brownian mo motion runs very deeply. It's not a formal analog. It goes much more than just being a formal analog. And that's really what the paper is about, is that this comes from something fundamental uh, about discrete approximation. So I should say my own interest in them, my own interests really, um, at least right now, are focused on um, finite approximation of physical theories and, um, and uh, invariance principles. And probability and the way that order comes from randomness. So I'm very interested in this way that order comes from randomness and the kinds of things that 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 uh, that that what this can tell you about uh, spaces because you can explore spaces with Brownian paths and the, the the paths explore the spaces in a very fine way and you can study you can you know gives you information about you know, geometry and so on. And, and, and here, maybe in piatic setting, maybe it tells you something about number theory, I don't know. But it would be interesting. Um, so we have, so what do we have right now? We have this diffusion equation in the real set case. We understand what it is macroscopically. Uh, we have a formal analog in the piatic setting. And it appears to be just something formal, but it's more than that. And um, we'll dig into that now. So we want to look now at this microscopic origin of diffusion. It's, I never understood, really understood these arguments, I think. I never really understood diffusion, the diffusion equation until I studied probability. And once I studied probability, then I, all of a sudden it made sense to me where it came from, um, which is actually what got me interested in probability in the first place. Um, so this uh, physical description of movement in the die, uh, it has a microscopic origin. And the point is to view the die not as a continuous medium, because it's not, <laughs> right? It's atoms. Uh, you don't view it as a continuous medium. View it as just a large collection of, view the die as just a large collection of particles. And they bounce around, they interact. So we normalize the concentrate. We've already actually normalized the concentration because we've said it starts as a delta function. But you know, in general, you'd normalize the concentration so it's a, a probability density function. Um, and um, and so now we view this fundamental solution as a probability density function that gives you a point mass measure times zero. 
So given a, mo a molecule of the dye, let's take yt to give the position of the molecule at time t. Now for any Borel subset b of r, uh, we define the probability that yt is in b in this Borel set to just be the integral of the probability density function right over b. And no, notice that this is, this is exactly the same setup as in QP. There's only, the only difference is what we change rho to be a solution instead of being a solution to the real diffusion equation. This is a solution to the piatic diffusion equation instead of B being a Borel set in a Borel subset of R, B is just a Borel set of Q. And uh, DX is now just the D mu X. David, the reason is that you are using the theory of Markov processes, and this theory works on metric spaces. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, you mean the, the reason? Oh, the reason why this is 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 the same for everything. That, that, this is the, the the way of constructing a, a Markov process. Yes. Okay. Right. But this approach works uh, well on any metric space, particularly in a Polish space. Yes, exactly. And I think there was a great lecture. Uh, so last year in the, uh, in the um, last year in uh, the Piatic conference, uh, I guess a Gregorian, right? I think uh, gave this talk on diffusion metric spaces and uh -huh. exactly. Absolutely beautiful talk. I mean, I just, I just love that talk. Um, but he talks a lot of, he talks about this, and there's done a lot of work in that area. In that area, um, I haven't studied diffusion so much in metric spaces in general, but I am starting to study geomet, uh, uh, um, diffusion in fractal spaces. Um, um, so hopefully, something will come out of that soon. Which is, you know, basically like the QP is an example of uh, like a fractal space. But this is mu is just the measure, um, the measure on um, QP. So measure on QP. But yeah, the framework is very general, metric spaces in general. Um, so making the necessary adjustments, right? We can we can use the same framework for for anything. And I'm really trying to want to to look at a general framework for studying um, discrete uh, convergence of discrete time random walks. So, I, so yeah, Wilson, I'm I'm very interested in seeing if you see that this can be done in a more general way than I have it because I I, I would like to be able to to do this even more generally. Um, on metric spaces or metric measure space, maybe probably metric measure spaces. But um, so uh, so we'll just lay out some definitions, which we'll need to, to keep track of um, individual particles um, to to build a frame, you know, build a framework for keeping track of particle motion. So a continuous time interval i is an interval is just a, an interval containing um, one of these intervals. For some t, it's like this, or or, or it's zero infinity. So it doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't have to be. Um, um, unbounded, but you start at zero. Uh, and take S to be either the real numbers or the piatic numbers. In general, it just needs to be a Polish space. And this is the space of all paths in S with domain I. So a path space of S uh, is just a subset of the, sp the set of all paths. Um, 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 so that all the paths in the subset are also uh, have domain I. Uh, and so general, well, generally speaking, this is too big of a space to work with, right? The space of small paths is enormous. Um, so generally speaking, in the theory of diffusion, you don't really want to work in that space. In the, in the setting of real diffusion, you really work in the continuous functions. Um, and then more generally in the squirrel hut functions, which are the paths that are cat-like um, with, the, with the topology that makes makes um, um, makes uh, makes the path space itself a Polish space. Um, and uh, I'll comment on that in just a moment. So an epoch for paths in a path space is a strictly increasing positive finite sequence that's valued in I. Um, 
positive. It's just, it's useful to make some restrictions for later. A root for paths is a finite sequence. So, of sorry, paths. Patrick, we are talking about a sequence of time. Uh, yeah, so an epoch is a time, are the time points. Yeah, so this is like T1, T2. Okay. Yeah, these are just the time points. And it's just finitely many of them. Yeah, these are time points. The root is a sequence of Borel sets and the history is a pairing of an initial time point and an initial Borel set and then time points in future and, 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 and other Borel sets. This is a root and this is an epoch. So the root has one more place than the epoch, uh, an initial start, uh, which is a starting point. And typically, we just make the starting point. We we condition to have a fixed, uh, an actual starting point. Um, I actually kind of view this a little bit differently. I, I should say I sort of see the the Brownian motion is really a motion in the. So if you, if you look at a Brownian motion, so you can sort of think about, you, th you think about R and and you think about the n-dimensional Euclidean space. I sort of see the Brownian motion as a motion in R n that acts on the Euclidean space. So in that sense, it always starts at zero, right? Because the motion, you, are, you always start where you start. So, so the motion, you start at zero, but then it's it's the motion that you're looking at. So you add the motion to the point in the Euclidean space to move the point. So you don't need to really think about the Brownian motion as being conditioned to start at a point. It always starts at zero, but it moves a point. Um, I didn't write this in this framework here, but I think I'm gonna change it in the paper a little bit. It makes it kind of nice when you when you do the discrete approximations um, to not have to worry about the starting point, but just thinking about the motion is actually a motion is actually um, moving things. Um, so the motion always starts at zero, even though the path might not start at zero. This is okay because the measures are going to be um, I mean, you have to be translation invariant. Maybe symmetric under translation. So for any history, a, the measures aren't, of course, because you have to be con you're concentrated at certain points if you move it to zero. But the point is, is that you can move the um, starting point. So for any history h, then denote respectively by e of h and a u of h this epoch associated to h and the root associated to h. So I should just draw and then l of h is the, the number of places of the, the epoch. So it's it's really like if you start here, say you start at the point x naught, and maybe we have like a, here is a set u um, one, and here is another guy u two, and another one u three. UN and the history tells you that at time one, you're somewhere in here. At time two, you're somewhere in here. At time three, and so on. So we can build from this. Uh, a a uh, uh, um, simple sets on which we can define measures. So we define uh, by H the set of all histories for a past base H. So these are all. This is the set of all histories, and we define a function from H to the subsets of the power set defined in this way, given in this way. So C of H is just the set of all paths in your path space, so that at the given time point in the history, you're at that point, that place, that, that, uh, that Borel set in the root. And so you look at all the paths that start at, in this case, we'll just have it start at X naught, but it starts at this point here and it moves, well, we'll just have to start at zero. So you, you, you start at zero, it's a set of all paths 
that are in his, this at T1, in U2 at T2, in U3 at T3, and that's what C of H is. So C, C of big H, C of the history, the image of the all histories is just the set of simple cylinder sets of omega. These simple cylinder sets, they don't form a sigma algebra, but they do form a pi system. The intersection of any two of them is once again a, um, a simple cylinder set, um, but they generate a sigma algebra. And so this sigma of C of H, this is the set of cylinder sets, which is a sigma algebra generated by the set of simple cylinder sets. So we can define a pre-measure. The idea is to define a pre-measure on the space. So how do we define a pre-measure? Well, this is how we define the pre-measure. Now, this is all really general, right? I mean, we don't, you don't need to be in the real zorpiatics for this at all. This is totally general. Um, um, this works in any polar space. Um, so, so for each H, for each history, uh, if the, uh, initial set in the root contains zero, <clears throat> then we're going to define the probability of that simple cylinder set in this way. So it looks a little complicated when we write it, but really all it is is this is the difference in time points in which you had to move from a point in one point in the root to uh, in the, so here. All right. So let's just go from T2 to T3. In T2, this is T3. The time duration, the duration was T3 minus T2. You started at some point X2, you end at some point X3. And this gives you the density. You integrate over U2 and it gives you a density. Uh, and if you integrate then over the X3, you get the probability that you went from U2 to U3 in the time duration T3 minus T2. And so this is why we get this as the integrand. Um, the condition, of course, that PC of H is equal to zero um, if U not of H does not contain zero is the uh, forcing of the path to start at zero times zero. So, so the function P is a pre-measure on the simple cylinder sets. The film post cylinder sorts form a pi system. And in both the real and piatic settings, if omega is the set of all functions, then P extends to a measure on that sigma algebra. And this is Kolmogorov extension. This is by the Kolmogorov extension down. And there's consistency um, requirements and so on, but we'll have all that. So, uh, so the, uh, the point, though, is, is that this space is too large to do analysis on because the functions are just set of all functions and we have to have some specification. Um, we'll do that in a second. Um, but first, we associate a stochastic process with these measures. Uh, we build a stochastic process in the space. So we take y to be a function on i cross fi of s, uh, fi colon s. So i cross the path space. Uh, I shouldn't write it like this. I should say I cross F I S. So it's the Cartesian product. Ah, I need to erase that. So we take I, uh, take Y to be a function on that Cartesian product. Y of the pair T omega is just omega of T. It just evaluates omega at the time point T. Curry variables to get the um, to get the, uh, for each time t to get a random variable, uh, y t is just evaluation of path at time t. So y maps t to the random variable y t, which is just evaluation of time t. And this triple is a stochastic process. So what does this triple describe? Well, we have to first restrict f of it. So the point is in the real setting, Y will have a version in the space of continuous paths. And the QP setting, Y will have a version in the Skorohut space. And then the, denote, we'll denote um, these versions by Y's uh, continuous paths from I to R, and then W is Wiener measure. And then Y, is, again, the, this, the same stochastic process on the underlying sets. 
Um, this is the, the score hut space, and this is the measure on the score hut space. So this, uh, these stochastic processes are just the triple, the, the function and then the underlying measure space. Are we okay at this point? I um, just want to make sure any questions or comments or? No, 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 no questions. Well, uh, maybe a comment, uh, mm. David. Mm. Uh, I think that so far you have used, I mean, all the results can be formulated in the framework of metric groups. You yes. need a topological group with a topology coming from a metric. Okay. Yes. So in a metric group, uh, uh, examples of metric groups are the real number, the periodic number, and the uh, and the group of Adele's. Yes. So if you if you, if you work with the notion of metric group, you can cover more cases: R, Q, P, the Adele's with with the, with the addition, um, the complex numbers probably, and, and more. Yeah. Right, right. And I think, uh, I wonder, I mean, certainly in the reals, you could have, certainly in the real setting, you could have, you know, Lie groups and, and, and these sorts of things. No, but, but, but you need that the topology, the topology must be metric. Because if I understood correctly, you need the standard um, results of Markov processes. Yes. And this theory, works very well in metric spaces. Yes. For instance, the Skorohov theory, the Skorohov theory can mm -hmm. be formulated in metric space. There are classical books uh, presenting this, this, this Skorohov space uh, theory on metric space. Right. Right. I just have a technical question. The measures W and P are pullback measures from the other measure that you had? Uh, these are the measures induced on yeah. on these space. So, so this is so so when so to say this as a version just means that they agree on the uh, on the cylinder sets. So, well, so the the finite dimensional distributions will agree. Um, is is the point, and it's a measure on these spaces. Uh, that's basically the idea. Okay, thanks. So um, you can't distinguish. So if you saw this brown, I mean, basically it, it's a little tricky here, right? Because the, the space of continuous paths, the space of continuous paths. So if you look at this space here in the reals, the space of all paths, the space of continuous paths is not a measurable subspe subset. <laughs> because continuity depend, depends on uncountably many time points where this is built only from countably, this is only, these are only determined by countably many time points. So you have to build a different process, a different, you really do have to build a different version of the process. It's not just that, that the continuous functions are a measurable subset, so it kind of descends. It's not like that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's a more complicated construction. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually, uh, so yeah, I, I and same with the score hut space. This is this is much too big of a space, and it doesn't even it doesn't even give you the con the, the continuous paths as a as a measurable subspace. But in we'll see in just a oh I'm actually running out of time. I didn't realize this. Uh, gosh, I thought I had more time. Um, but so in the and we'll see in just a moment. We talk about when we talk about the finite approximation that we're going to build processes in the real setting. Uh, on the score hut space, David. And that me, setting. Let me make let me make a comment. Don't worry if you need extra time. We can continue okay. the coming week. Oh, okay, great, great. No great, problem. Great. great, that's wonderful. I I I would love to actually because I can go on if I if I take another week, I can go into some of the uh, technical details of the actual calculations that are in the paper, which might be interesting because the that's where the that's where the new paper is very different from the other one. Um, Maybe what I can, should I do is, I don't know how many more minutes I have right now. Is it five minutes? The seminar is one, one hour, one hour and 30 minutes, one hour, but you can stop or let's say. So maybe what I can do is I can go through two and then, and then I'll just summarize what the results are uh, 
before going into the next time. Okay, perfect. So I can just kind of give what the results actually end up being. That sounds good. Cool, cool, great. So, so, so the idea is, uh, well, let's see. Yeah, okay, so I'll just go one more slide here. So in the real setting, uh, the indeterministic microscopic movement of each particle gives rise to the bulk property of the diffusion. That's the point, right? Is that you have this, you have this, each particle is moving and you can describe the probability associated to the movement of each particle, which is a Brownian, follows Brownian paths. And then, uh, and then the bulk property of the diffusion is coming out of all this microscopic randomness. But when you view the bulk, it just smooths out nicely the same way every single time. Uh, so in this way, the orderly process of what appears to be this orderly process of diffusion uh, comes from this accumulation of random events. Um, this isn't the end of the story, though. And my, my, from my perspective, this is just the beginning, because then you can think, well, where does the microscopic movement come from? And the microscopic movement comes from some collisions uh, and some randomness that you're studying at that microscopic level that then gives rise to the Brownian motion, which then in bulk gives rise to this diffusion, um, this macroscopic diffusion. So um, I'll just say this first thing. In the real case, the microscopic motion arises from the collisions. Collisions are modeled by discrete time random walks that approximate the diffusion process. And then the, the point is, is in the QP setting is strikingly analogous where this diffusion in the QP setting is also coming from discrete time random walks. And what we'll do next time is we'll discuss what these discrete time random walks are in the real case, what they are in the QP case. Now in the real case, the discrete time random walks, it turns out that it really doesn't matter what it is uh, so long as they satisfy some very general problem, you know, like mean free and, uh, and finite variance uh, and you just sum up a bunch of steps. That's summing up with a bunch of steps with an appropriate scaling in limit will give you this, uh, will give you this um, discrete time, uh, will give you the Brownian motion. And in the piatic setting, we just identify a specific discrete time random walk and show that, that gives you as a, some kind of limit, as a weak star limit of measures actually, it gives you the, uh, the Brownian motion in the piatic setting. Um, but then what you want to do is also you want to show that it isn't dependent, very dependent on which process you happen to take. So I, I wanted to go to the very end. Um, so we'll talk about this next time, I guess. Um, in the real setting, right, you have this random walk that's bouncing left and right, probably half. It doesn't have to be that one. It's just, it's just purely an example of one. Uh, and in the piatic setting, you take some kind of finite group, or not finite group, a discrete group um, that embeds nicely into the piatics and your, your random walk is just really a, it's really just a, it's really ends up being a, um, a, a random walk in an energy landscape. And this is sort of your energy landscape. Uh, and this is where the hierarchical structure of the, of the piatics comes in because you're really jumping between energy, like energy levels. Um, I sort of view this as like a piatic atom, a discretized version of QP. That's like an atom. And, um, and you're jumping between these energy levels uh, uniformly in each circle once you make the jump. And you add up a bunch of these jumps and you scale them properly. Now, I guess what I wanted to mention is why, what's the main difference? Um, mm, so I can say it here. I want to make, what's the main difference that I wanted to make? Sure. Um, so the idea is that if you have these, are going to, we'll discuss this next time. This is a certain kind of spatial scaling. This is kind of a time scaling of a random walk. The idea is, is that given each random walk, you're going to have an embedding of that random walk. So you have a primitive, the idea is that you have a primitive, so idea. You have some kind of primitive random walk. on a discrete space. It embeds 
uh, and I should say discrete time random walk. And it embeds into uh, into your fee, your f equals r or qp. So it's primitive random walk embeds, and and there's only one. There's only one random walk in the, in, in, in the setting, and, and there, there's only one sort of primitive space and primitive random walk. You, have, you, you start with some kind of generator, and it tells you how you make one jump, and you just add up a bunch of those jumps. And this gives you a primitive random walk, but you can't. The idea is, is that you don't really, like even on the reels, when you have 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, your, um, your discrete space is the integers and you're just walking along the integers. The idea though is that you don't really know. I mean, no matter how you embed it, you, you don't, if you're, if you're this particle um, following this walk, well, you only know that you've stepped a certain number of times right or a certain number of times left. Uh, you don't know how far that is. You have a clock. And it's tick, 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 tick. You only know how many ticks have passed. You don't know what the time is. When you embed, you put a scale on the distance and you put a scale on the time. So you now know that a tick is two seconds or one second or a nanosecond. And then you know that the, the time, the distance step is maybe a foot or, or a, a meter or a centimeter or you know, an angstrom or something, uh, something like this. It, it's it's a, some, some unit of distance. But when you're that particle, you have no reference really to say what your distance or time scale is. But in limit, you get a diffusion. So it's that that comes out in limit, like a uh, somehow. Um, so this is the kind of thing we build in the in QP as well, where you have some primitive random walk that's being embedded. And when you take a limit of these embeddings, so long as space and time are being scaled appropriately, and this is the scaling, in the real setting, B is two. In the piatic setting, you have the very, it could be two as well, but it doesn't have to be. But you have that this spatial scaling to some power, to the B power, uh, divided by the time scaling is going, tending to some constant. And that's, case, you'll have convergence of the random walk to the Brownian motion. So in the current work, in the, in the previous work, we did this, but the convergence is the weak star convergence and the space of bounded measures um, um, uh, on zero T. Oh, I think I got this reversed in my statement here. And in the in the in the previous case, oh yeah, I got this. This is twenty. Um, in the previous case, we had to restrict b to one infinity, so we had to put a restriction on b to one infinity. And the new result, uh, b is in zero infinity. In the previous result, we only had the weak star convergence on this space where you had to have compact time intervals. And in the current setting, we actually have a more a uniform result. The estimates are actually uh, uniform estimates uh, in, in T. And so we actually get weeks, I, you know, we actually get weak star convergence in the space of bounded measures on D0 infinity rather than D0 T. So these are the fundamental differences between the previous result and this result. And the reason why is in the previous results, the estimates are, you know, they're complicated and the calculations are, are, are it, it, it's hard to improve. I couldn't see how to improve it. So it took a different approach completely. Did all calculations only with respect to the primitive space and found very uniform ways of making the calculations. And then the, 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 there's a real reason for the estimates where the estimates in the previous case you know, if you ask me off the top of my head, how do you go and make these estimates? I don't know. You know, I mean, I have to go back and you know, hack, hack, hack through every single lemma and make sure that each thing was needed is done. Where the new result, it's a completely clean, clear 
understandable reason for why these certain moment estimates are the way they are. And it gives you a result for all B and it gives you a uniform result in T so that you actually get the weak star convergence in the space. In the space. It also gives you a method of doing, this, uh, of doing this that's highly generalizable. And in fact, there's absolutely no reason um, that you're limited to QP. You should be able to um, prove the same results in the setting of Rudarajan's 1997 paper. It should go through fine. The only difficulty is there's a question about what higher dimensional chaotic Brownian motion should actually be. And I have a, and a student of mine and I are actually working on that right now. And we actually have some, some results and hopefully at some point he can come on and give a talk <laughs> on that work. But that's, that's where it's going. And so I, I, um, I guess uh, I can finish some of this next time if you want, or I wait a week or whatever, whatever you guys want me to do. Okay, perfect. No, we can stop here uh, and you can continue the coming week. Uh, maybe. Okay, great, 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 great. I, it was a it was a very nice talk. Thank uh, you. Uh, probably I'm gonna make some comments uh, with respect to the to the to the to the heat equation to the periodic heat equation in the n-dimensional case. Right now, I mean, uh, after 20 years, there are many results. I mean, we know yes. that in a very very general way. David. For yes. instance, you can see in my my book in lecture notes in mathematics. Uh, 2174, I think. In, in, this, in, this, in this book, you can see many, many the heat equations in, in arbitrary dimensions. Okay. Yes. Okay. And there are many, 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 many. So I'm curious in this, in this, yeah, I, I, need, to, I need to look more carefully because I, I think, uh, but they, do, they, do they assume, uh, so, Because you don't restrict yourself, you don't restrict yourself even to uh, to um, heat equations that are given by operators that have a symbol. Exactly. You, this is very general. Really, yeah. the, the the construction, the most general construction that I know, uh, was uh, is based in in a, in a work of Kochubey. Uh, yes. In the eighties, Anatoly Kochubey was was able to construct very general heat equations on periodics, but these equations uh, have variable coefficients. Right. Uh, starting with, with with the basic Vladimir equation, then it is possible to introduce derivatives of higher order, Vladimir derivatives of higher order, and multiply these derivatives by 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 um, variable coefficients. And in this way, you can construct a very, very general class of heat equations. Okay. I think Al Al Albaverio does this as well. He has, he has, he has some work on Albaverio, but, but, but Kachibe does this, and Kachibe does this, I think. Yeah, he has a uh, well, well, book. No, I, I don't, I, I, no, it, this is in a completely different way. Ah, okay. This is a completely different way. Uh, uh, and then, in, I don't remember, 15 years ago, we extended. Ten yes. years ago, we extended this this, this result of of, of Kochubey. Right. In addition, as I said, there are if, if we use the notion of a liquid polynomial, we can right. construct heat equations on PI. Right. The key point, uh, David, is that in in the in the in the PI, in the real frame. The function absolute value of x raised to, to sigma is negative definite if and only if sigma is between zero and two. Yes. This right. is the key point. That's right. But in the periodic case, the absolute value of x, the, the, the periodic absolute value of x raised to sigma is a negative definite function with sigma below is greater than zero, greater right. or equal than zero. Right. This changes the game. Completely. Right, Be because you have this restriction in the reals where you can only choose it between zero and two, or open at zero, closed at two. Yeah. But in the periodics, it's everything because you, yeah. For this reason, in the periodic framework, there are many, many more heat equations that in the real. This is right. This is, that's not the, and th there are many, many equations. Yeah, it's, I'm. I, I'm curious. So, so one of the things I've I'm, I'm been studying is. Which ones, which which of these actually come as scaling limits? Oh, that's a different story. That's yeah, a different I, story. I, 
I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but, but there's, uh, I, I think, so I, I don't want to comment. I, I, I certainly no, wouldn't comment. Video. Video. That's an important <laughs> restriction, the, scal the scaling situation that imposes a, an important restriction. Yeah, and, and so I think that, I think that, for example, that you end up being forced into radially symmetric operators. For instance? Yeah. For instance, yeah. And so okay. these sorts of things, but I, I, um, but there's no reason, there's no reason to limit study, right? <laughs> to just those ones. It's, it's interesting. I think it's, I think it's very interesting to see this very general mm -hmm. class of operators that give you diffusions and then to say, well, which ones are those that, that come in this way? And, and so that's, that's kind of the thing we're trying to study right now. Um, okay. Let me tell you another interesting thing that can be used, that you can be used in, in, in your, in, in the introduction of the paper, in, in, yeah. in physical applications, typically one starts with a discrete model. With a discrete probabilistic model, typically this model uh, is, a, is a Markov chain. And then by a limit process, we get a heat equation, a master equation, a, a, a continuous version of, of, of the original equation. This is important in terms of applications. And Mathematically speaking, this means that you start with, with a Markov chain, and then this Markov chain is embedded in, 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 a Markov, in a continuous Markov process. And the explanation, the mathematical explanation of this phenomenon is, is, is unknown. This is a little bit different because here we are not interested in scaling, in, in scaling, there, 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 there is no a scale involved. Right. But this is important in terms of application. You start with a discrete model and then you get a continuous model. This is the original uh, motivation the, the, uh, of Schwinger. You'll see? This is the original motivation of Schwinger that Baradarjan, you right. know, started many years ago. Yes, that was that was there. That was from the nineteen the DV, the, the the ninety four paper ninety three exactly. ninety four works on on the finite approximation of quantum systems, exactly. right? And that's that's the thing that interests me is is that is because we I, I would say that a physical theory what's what's one of the critical things that you have to have in a physical theory it has to be finitely approximable, exactly. Uh, and so and so everything we work everything we work with physically has to be finitely approximable. So given a physical theory. Do you have these finite approximations of it? And can you tell the difference between a, a purely discrete theory and a continuous theory? Yeah. You shouldn't be able to. This is important in terms of practical application. Yeah, in fact, actually, the, the, the funny thing is, is that, um, that the, this original work came out because I, we were working on different problems with, uh, with uh, in diffusion, and I didn't have any intuition about uh, piatic diffusion. Um, and uh, I kept thinking about the real diffusion. Well, if I were thinking about real diffusion, what would I do? And I realized every time I would think about something with real diffusion, what would I think of? I would think of a random walk, a discrete time random walk, because continuous time is too hard to, it's hard to think about what a continuous time process is like. It's continuous. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. So, so you think, well, what if I could just take one step and another step and another step? I could reduce it to counting problems, basically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so we started thinking, well, what about these discrete time processes in the reals? It tells us how things work in the reals. What about in the piatics? So of course the natural thing was, well, let's look and see where there's, where someone developed the discrete time um, random walks that converge to this piatic Brownian motion. And we were looking for it, looking for it. We couldn't find it. And I thought that's weird. I mean, this seems like a very, very natural question to ask. Why isn't, why isn't it already done? Um, and I, I just sort of figured that probably it was because everybody working on this was just, they just, I mean, I needed to think discreetly and they probably were just smarter than me. So they didn't, they didn't need to, they didn't need to think, they didn't need that intuition. They already had it somehow, but I didn't. <laughs> so, so I thought, I thought, well, I got, I'm a simple guy. I gotta, I gotta think about discrete time. What is this thing? And, and, and actually since the funny thing is, is that uh, whenever I, now, whenever I have these questions, whenever I'm doing some of the continuous time Brownian motion in the, in, the, in the piatic setting, I just think back, oh, what would happen to the discrete time process? And you kind of, you kind of know what happened there, which means you know what happens in the, in the other. 
But so. there is, the, the, I mean, you want to understand this uh, situation from a physical point of view, I strongly recommend to study master's equation. I'm going to send you my, my latest paper. Yes. In which I uh, explain uh, something about master equations and the connection between master equations and, and PIs. Great, great. Yeah, I, I should say, I, I just, I, uh, whenever I do anything, <laughs> I always, I always look at your work. <laughs> this is because I always, I always, I, I, I always like look over your papers and 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 see what you're doing because I just, I just love the work that you do. And uh, so I, 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 the 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 Adelic equation, you know, I just sat there looking through everything in your paper, and <laughs> so there's always a reference to <laughs> to you because <laughs> it's always, it's always a starting point for me is to like, okay, what did you do? Huh, that's really neat. <laughs> Okay, so, guys, do you have more comments or questions for David? Okay, yes. thank you, David. So you. please, uh, we, we, we wait for the second part to come in. I'm going to announce with, with the same title, but I'm going to add part two. Part two, great. And I'll, I'll, I'll um, maybe I'll go into some, some of the actual moment calculations. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye, guys. I'm, I'm going to stay with my students in Mexico to talk about some technical detail. Okay, but turn okay. off the recording. Bye-bye, Patrick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, David. I have to turn off the recording. Bye. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>